Hi, I'm Elliot Williams. I'm here at the Supply Frame Design Lab with Mike Osman and Dominic Spill, who just got off the stage demonstrating controlling infrared uh, devices with fire. We came up with this ridiculous pirate theme because we were just trying to come up with names and, and Dominic said, it's IR, it's I, R. <laughs> so uh, here we are. So I was listening to the audience as you guys were giving your talk, and somebody said, how many pirates does it take to turn on a TV with a sparkler? <laughs> <laughs> and that is basically, that, that partly sums up this talk. Um, for those of you who weren't in the audience, they were uh, investigating infrared signals and trying to turn on TVs, playing with uh, remote control headphones, and trying to turn, uh, debunk the urban legend that you can turn on uh, traffic lights using the preemption system. What was that? Yeah, traffic, traffic light traffic preemption, signal preemption yeah. systems. Yeah, and they did, and there was a big traffic light on stage, and it went green. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about how you got into doing IR stuff. I I don't even remember. I I just remember picking up an IR transistor at some point and uh, hooking up to an ADC board that we had, the the great fed board that we've been building. And, and just starting to explore things and realizing there was so much more than, than TV remotes and seeing all sorts of strange things and, and, and applying that software-defined radio technique that we've used with HackRF and, and other um, technologies and applying that to infrared to see what we could get that wasn't just on off key 38 kilohertz standard TV remote stuff. Yeah, I found it super interesting that the headphones were actually just basically radio except over light. I mean, it was just FM radio, right? but with a different carrier. Yeah, instead we, instead of putting the signal out over a radio antenna, they just use that signal to modulate an LED, and that's it. Yeah. Otherwise, it's the exact same thing as a as a radio uh, um, uh, audio over radio circuit. Yeah, that's great, and it makes it really like hacker friendly. Like this is stuff mm -hmm. you can DIY yourself. This is yeah. a three megahertz carrier, and it's super simple because. Um, you know, it's, it's line of sight, you don't have to worry about licensing, you don't have to worry about kind of um, mm -hmm. spurious emissions and things like that. You can just play around with this stuff with some LEDs and, um, and various other fairly simple circuits um, and, and interact with a lot of things. And that's why I think manufacturers like to build those headphones like that. They, they don't have to worry about licensing, they can sell them all over the world. They, um, mm -hmm. They're short range, they're line of sight. Um, the other thing you guys did after that was this uh, Infrared receiver with fire thing. Okay. Yeah, we used uh, we tried a whole bunch of different sources of flame, and at one point we had a lighter that flickered more than other lighters, and it had we noticed that it had higher frequency content. And of course, specifically, we want content in the neighborhood of 38 kilohertz for a for the TV remote. And uh, so we thought, well, we need we need flame that f flickers more or that is more active in some way. And so we started exploring things uh, like larger fires and, and fireworks. And uh, the thing we had the most success with in our lab was a sparkler. And this is the video of Dominic spinning the wheel and trying to hold the sparkler in exactly the right place as it burns down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the problem with it is it's a moving target. Yeah. And, and so trying to line up a spinning bike wheel and a, a, a burning sparkler with you know, spokes and things. It's while looking up the oscilloscope. While, uh, while trying to make while, sure you get a, an output on the oscilloscope. But we, exactly. we found that not only did we have to have fire that was active in the region of 38 kilohertz, but we also had to have uh, the, we we had to use that spinning bicycle wheel because we needed to ha we couldn't we couldn't like move a card past the flame fast enough by hand mm -hmm. to get a data encoding uh, at, at anywhere near yeah. the, the right baud rate. Uh, but with a bicycle wheel spinning like as fast as we could get it to go, we were just able to get into that range. Yeah, that's super. So I mean, it's, it's sort of possible that this could have happened, not like it did in the video, right? But but with a sparkler and a bike wheel and you know patience and not burning your fingers. <laughs> yeah. so the big showpiece was the uh, uh, automotive preemption system and that was just beautiful. Um, I like that you guys looked at the, how the system works. I mean, buying your own box gets you, gets you the keys to the kingdom, doesn't it? Yeah, and it's interesting that there are laws, there's a federal law and then there are various state and local laws around the country that uh, make it a little bit tricky to experiment with some of that stuff. Yeah, of course. Um, for the most part, it, 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 you can get into trouble by playing with the emitters that are mounted on cars, or like it's illegal to sell one of those emitters okay. uh, for non-authorized use. 
Um, but it's not, as far as we can tell, anywhere illegal to sell or buy the detector systems. Right. Uh, so we just bought one of the detectors off eBay and started experimenting with it. <laughs> eBay's fantastic, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and I think that was the only responsible way we could have played with that technology oh, yeah. because there's, it's, it's safety critical. So there's oh, yeah. uh, getting hold of it and then just mounting it in a lab and we, we had to build cables for it that mm -hmm. we had some documentation for and things like that. But at that point we were able to um, hook up a scope to the signals and, and see what was going on and that made it much easier once we'd built a circuit that would trigger it to try and build um, more unusual contraptions and, and circuits that would that would trigger it. Yeah, but I'm stoked to see that because that's been an urban legend since you know since I was a kid um, that you can do this that you can blink lights and the traffic signals will, uh, will switch. I'm surprised how little filtering they had on it. Oh, yeah. The only thing that they, they're pretty good at filtering out is uh, 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 pulse frequencies that are very far outside of the pulse rate that they're expecting. They do require a pretty precise pulse frequency. Right. And I think that's something that was that was kind of tacked onto the system later because these, are, these things are kind of backwards compatible with systems that have been deployed since I think around the 70s. Yeah. Uh, and back then they weren't so precise and the stories, the urban legends of like taxi drivers changing headlights by flicking their headlights and things like yeah. that may, may have actually been true stories back then. Yeah. Uh, but the systems that are deployed today require a, a much more precise control system on the emitter. The, and the, the hack that we did on the bike light, of course, was was realizing that that these these detectors on the light poles are are actually sensitive to either a, a positive going pulse edge or a negative going pulse edge and so you can instead of doing the super short pulses that the flash tubes on emergency vehicles use we could use a square wave at half that rate or we could use super short negative going pulses at the pulse rate and so we were we were, we were taking a headlight and and having it look like it's on all the time but pulsing it negatively uh, at the right rate with very short pulses that are invisible to the naked eye. And I did that with a with an external microcontroller just wired up to the little FET that was built into the, the bicycle headlamp already. Yeah. And uh, uh, But actually the, the pro move really would be to reprogram the microcontroller that's actually built into the headlamp. Uh, there is one in there, sure. and the only reason I didn't do that was because I didn't have a programmer for it like on the airplane um, when I was hacking on this thing. Um, and also the fact that that microcontroller in this particular headlamp didn't have a crystal, uh, oh, nice. so I don't expect it to have a precise enough frequency, but if you could just hack on a crystal uh, oscillator to it, it would, you could use the original microcontroller probably and achieve the same thing. Yeah, fantastic. And what's next for this project? Fire? I don't know. It needs fire. We yeah, I mean, combining combining fire and and also triggering emergency vehicle preemption systems <laughs> seem, seems kind, go of, wrong? kind of great because, I mean, if the fire doesn't work then and, and goes out of hand, then a uh, fire truck's going to get there pretty quickly. <laughs> <It's actually laughs> or, us, isn't or at it? least so, the police, right? Yeah. Somebody's so on the way. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's not the best of ideas, but, but uh, one of the reasons we didn't tackle fire, um, tackle the, the preemption system with fire was that very precise timing and just getting a, um, a bicycle wheel to spin at that rate was was near impossible. Yeah. But yeah, maybe maybe we'll try that in the future. Who knows? Yeah, that's cool. I'm really looking forward to more people playing around with IR. That's been on my to-do list forever. You may have encouraged me to do so. I hope so. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. Thanks for having us.